So Graham Dyer wants to go to the gym for a rest. I thought no one fell for email scams anymore, that they were a thing of the past. But on a dawn raid with the City of London Police, the UK's leading anti-fraud squad, I discover that it's a rapidly growing industry that tricks people in Britain out of hundreds of millions of pounds every year. Open the doors to police! Stupid West Ham. It's be about time. Mm. It's live trade. Not only is internet fraud growing, it's evolved. A new generation of scammers has developed a sophisticated technique that exploits the booming popularity of Western dating websites. I felt like I'd been in a hypnotic state. And even looking back at it now, I'm still shocked. Anything on that you shouldn't have at the minute? Come on, mate, what's your name? You know that. But in the world of scams, where nothing is real, Separating lies from the truth is not as easy as it seems. Have I been sucked in? We don't know yet. Everyone else will say I have been. People fall in love online every day. I don't see that as a crime. Like most people who give internet dating a try, Brenda Park, an ex-air stewardess from West Sussex went online worried about nothing more than when the first response would come. November 2009, I signed up to internet dating. I was contacted by a chap calling himself Bradford Cole, who was 46, from Holland, with a 14-year-old daughter, having lost his partner three years previously and his headline on his profile read honesty is the best policy. We emailed one another, we set up an arrangement for him to call me, which he did. He just sounded like a really, really nice guy. Very loving, caring father, interested in the welfare of his daughter. Message one, Tuesday, 9th, February. Well, hello, um, this is Bradford. I just want to reach out to you and say hi. Let me know why you got my message, OK? Take care. Bye. It was really early into the relationship, and I actually thought that was a really nice way to speak to somebody. And I don't think anyone's ever left me a message that sounds quite like that. But Brenda, like hundreds of others each year, was about to discover that her new friend was not all that he seemed. I've come to Lagos to find out how the so-called romance scam works from the scammer's point of view. For years, Lagos has been one of the cities most associated with internet fraud, known locally as 419 after its number in the Nigerian Penal Code. In 2004, Felix Ekpa, a computer science graduate, saw some of his friends being drawn into this world. I saw boys around me doing good, driving big cars, and having a ball, you know, so I was like, okay, what's going on, what are they doing? So the adventurous side of me takes over and I go and find out. What Felix found in the internet cafes of Lagos was a fresh wave of scammers targeting dating websites used by Westerners. You go to the dating sites, you just take a picture from the internet, there are pictures of models, men on the internet, he put the picture there, uh, put an age, put a profile. Nothing there is real. Then you use that to contact other people on the dating site. When they send you a mail back, you try and get them to chat. Yahoo Messenger, one of the messengers. So you can discuss more, you can get to the point faster than having to send emails back and forth, you know. After a week, after a month, you will test, you know, throw up some lines, you have some financial problems, see how the person reacts. The general impression is, outside the country, uh, once you're white, you have money. It's a couple of thousands, it won't kill them. 
probably the system pays them back for losing such money. So you don't feel too bad. It's all right. It's not the person I took the money from that really feels the brunt. A month after first meeting online, Bradford told Brenda that he was leaving his home in Birmingham with his daughter and flying to the Benin Republic in Africa to close a lucrative computer deal. He started to email me from the hotel in Cotonou, which is the capital of the Benin Republic. He had all sorts of problems there, which he didn't discuss with me, to do with finances. Um, suddenly, I didn't hear anything for a couple of days, and then I presumed that the shipment had arrived and he was perhaps working on the contract and was busy. But then suddenly I received a phone call. He had been in hospital, been a hit and run. He had facial cuts and bruises, but his daughter was more seriously injured. She'd broken two teeth which had lacerated the inside of her mouth and she needed an operation. So I imagined this child who'd lost her mother just three years previously, who was now in pain in a hospital in a strange country, and naturally I was very concerned for her. I asked him how much the hospital bill was going to be, and it was £9,600. And I said to him there was no way that I could help him with that kind of money, it was out of the question. But it was just so difficult to walk away. My conscience just wouldn't let me walk away and leave a young girl in that situation. And so eventually I agreed and I sent the money to him, cash. Without realising it, Brenda had been sucked in by one of the scammers' most popular opening lines. Been in the hospital for two days, just regained consciousness. Car crash, yeah, on the way to the airport. <laughs> Car crash, armed robbery attack, um, uh, cancer, different stories. Usually the first time is not so much. Something like a seed. So after then it starts going bigger and bigger. The shipping office had then thrown a bombshell at him because he then had to pay import duty. So he now needed £22,500 in order to get the goods released from the docks. Like a gambler chasing the initial investment that I'd put into this man and his daughter, I raised the money and again it had to be paid in cash and that was actually on the bottom of the invoice. All foreign transactions had to be paid in cash. There's no fixed story of what's to be told. Different people get innovative, you know, and tell their own side of it. It's like you're building a movie, so you write your script. <laughs> Bradford's script had not yet come to an end. The following Saturday, he was due to fly back to Birmingham with a cheque for over three quarters of a million pounds, which he would use to pay Brenda back. Later that afternoon, I had a very distraught phone call from a taxi going back to the hotel, saying that when he'd reached the airport, they'd sent him to customs. Because he'd earned all of this money in the Benin Republic, he now had to pay some form of duty. And interestingly enough, it was another £22,000. It's like watching the reality TV show, you don't know what's going to happen next. It sounds like fun, but not for the person that is being scammed. It's not fun. Just over two months since they first met online, and with £60,000 owed to her, Brenda drove to Birmingham Airport to meet Bradford and his daughter Maureen for the first time. By this time, I was in such a dreadful state. I wasn't sleeping, I wasn't eating. In a very, very short space of time, I'd been manipulated by someone I'd never met into feeling responsible for the welfare of his daughter, into taking on his financial responsibilities. You get driven along on this wave of, of circumstances 
I had become completely involved in this amazing story. When Bradford failed to turn up at the airport, Brenda decided to confront him face to face at the home address he had given her. I saw a postman walking along and asked him if he knew this name at this address, standing right outside the house. And he said no, a Mr Singh Patel lived in this address and um, he'd never heard of Bradford Cole or Maureen Cole. And it was probably that defining moment when I realised that I had been scammed. I sat in my car and just had to get myself together and work out what I was going to do next. But for a few minutes, you're just completely and utterly alone, isolated, scared. I think the fear element comes to the fore and it's just totally and utterly shocking. I was completely overwhelmed by my own stupidity and the reality of what I'd done. What I've discovered about the romance scam is that although it starts with lies, it often ends up creating very real emotions. But I didn't realise how hard it could be to let go of these emotions until I met Caroline, a 55-year-old furniture painter from Tunbridge Wells. Hi. Hi darling, sorry, just downstairs getting a latte. Where are you? On my way home. When I arrive at Caroline's house, I find her on the phone to someone she calls Sabastin, the man the police believe scammed her out of her inheritance. OK, why don't you call me back in uh, 30 minutes so we can talk about it? You want me to call you back in 30 minutes? OK. So you're in regular contact? Mm. Every day. Does he like to know your movements? Yes. And if I say, like last night, I said I'm just popping up to London, blah, 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 he'll always usually text back and say, who are you seeing, where are you going? You know, it's quite, it's funny, isn't it, really, when you think he's thousands of miles away. <laughs> I could say anything. In August 2009, shortly after the death of her mother, Caroline formed a relationship online with someone who claimed to be Sabastine Rowland, a Briton of Greek origin, working in Nigeria. We did click. It was almost like he was here and with me, although he was in Africa. But I could hear that there was a definite African twang. And I knew deep down in my heart that he was black, which wasn't a problem. The problem was, why had he told me he was Greek? Caroline's instincts were right. Shortly after he'd received £4,000 from her for emergency medical treatment, Sabastine broke the scammer's golden rule and revealed that he was actually a Nigerian called Stephen and he'd used the money to fund an oil deal. He said, I feel absolutely awful getting the money from you. I'm trying to make a life for myself. I can't lie to you anymore because I, I had no idea. I, was, you know, I hadn't planned on falling in love with you made me very angry, actually. So it was a tough time for a couple of weeks after that. With their relationship on a new footing, Caroline and Sab decided to put the feelings they had developed for one another to the test and meet face to face in South Africa. The first time we met at the airport, he had tears in his eyes and tears in my eyes and just big, big hugs. And that was really, really exciting, really exciting. That was like Christmas. When you were a kid, you know, that sort of... What started as a holiday developed into three months of living together in a rented apartment. And when Caroline went into hospital for an operation, Saab was at her side. Every time I woke up, Saab was right there, you know, in the chair, either asleep or just looking at me. <laughs> and one of the pills I had to take every four hours, so he'd put his alarm on and wake up 
to wake me up, to give me my pills, and just looked after me, really. I couldn't have asked for a better nurse. <laughs> After Caroline returned to the UK, Saab persuaded her to invest large sums of money in an oil deal which never materialised. £30,000 down, Caroline was now completely broke. She told Saab he would never get any money out of her ever again, but the relationship continued. Have you ever felt similar to this about a man? No. No. Sad, isn't it? So late in life, really. I miss you. I miss you too. How much do you love me? Very much. No. As high as the sky, yeah. deep as the sea, yeah. and high as the mountain. No. <laughs> okay. Do it properly. Um, Caroline seemed to be genuinely in love with this guy. But I couldn't tell if Saab was just extraordinarily good at his job or had actually developed real feelings for Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> That's how much I love you. I don't love you, you know that, don't you? Uh, I know. <laughs> You're joking. Hmm. We're not talking about uh, one month or two month relationships. We're talking of years. Sometimes it takes one year, two years, to the point where the scammer starts bringing his real life into the story. You understand? Yeah, there are some cases that they really fall for each other, but there are some cases that it has never been real from the scammer's point of view, and it will never be real. But there are some cases that the guy really wish, ah, I wish I was using my real picture, my real uh, information for this. I could go and live with this woman and have a better life. You understand? There are some cases like that. I never would have guessed that a story knocked up by a scammer somewhere here in Nigeria could turn into a genuine relationship. From what I've seen of the sophisticated psychological techniques that scammers use to manipulate their victims, the question remains. Has Saab stopped scamming Caroline? Or is he playing a much longer game? I can't get any housing benefit because they want to know, they want me, basically they want me to prove where all the money's gone. They want you to prove, sorry, they, they want you to prove what? Where all my money's gone. And soccer won't send me a letter, they won't send a covering note that would prove to the benefits that, you know, that's where the money went. So they're now say you know, my housing office is now saying that, um, you know, unless soccer do that letter for me, they're, they're I'm not going to get the money, and therefore they're, they're going to have to start proceedings to evict me from the flat. Can't you get another station to do it? Yeah, involved. but they're not, darling, they're not going to send me a note or a letter unless, I've, if, unless I say, investigate the bastard. What I don't understand is the reason why they're asking you to investigate something which you do not want to. Think about it. Even if it happens that we met online, we fell in love, and you sent me some money, it doesn't give anyone the right to say that I have scammed you. People fall in love online every day. If a person happens to send money out of uh, help to some love, I don't see that as a crime. But has there ever been a point where you haven't had any doubts, where you've been 100% right? I can't imagine what it feels like to be in a relationship with so much uncertainty and doubt. But in Nigeria, I find out that the emotional turmoil can be just as acute on the scammer's side. During the two years he spent scamming an American woman called Deborah, Felix's conscience grew heavier by the day. When he got to that point where this has gone too far, 
you know, I couldn't live with myself anymore. And I felt that I had to leave what I was doing. You know? I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to tell the truth to Dan. But it took a period of like two, three months, you know. I kept trying to say it and then not saying it till it got to the point where I'm going to tell you something, you're going to be pissed, you're going to hate me, I'm sorry. Um, but I need to say it so I can be free, you know. And I sent the email and I told her. The pictures I sent you are not my pictures, they're not real. The stories I've been giving you are fake. I'm taking the chance to tell you because I'm feeling terrible about it. But I'm putting my word now and telling you that I'm going to pay you back. I was building a relationship based on scam to where I got to really know you and feel what you're feeling. And because of that relationship, I understand your life. I know you so much. It felt very good when I sent out the first $1,000 back. The house I've been carrying on me has been, you know, taking off me. And I felt free. I felt free. I don't know how to describe it, but I felt free. I felt, okay, now I'm living for real. It's, not, it's no longer a lie. If Felix was able to come clean and start an honest relationship with a woman he scammed, who's to say Sab isn't doing the same with Caroline? Hello. Oh, one is Sab, it's Barney. Hello, Barney. During my time in Lagos, I repeatedly try and set up a meeting with Sab, who claims he wants to start a new life with Caroline. You, you want to go to England? Somehow, our meeting never materialises. I just thought we were going to meet in Nigeria. It'd be nice to meet you whilst we're here. But maybe I'm missing the point, because in a world where nothing is as it seems, who am I to judge what is real and what is not? How do you think you look back on all this then? Insanity. And now I've found sanity. <laughs> and peace. I don't feel that at all at the moment, but wouldn't that be great if that's how I could look back on it? Without regret too, because how, where does that get you? It's life, isn't it? I don't think anyone who hasn't been through the experience knows how deep the financial and emotional effects of being scammed can be. But I think there is something far more precious than the money or broken hearts at stake. The biggest casualty in all of this is trust. And without trust, the world would be a very unforgiving place. <laughs>